good afternoon mohammed and uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here today no it's my pleasure so good so and thank you very much for coming to the session the other day also i think it was very uh, end of illuminating but today for the benefit of all what we are planning to going to do is we will end of uh, break down this the whole categories for eb1a now many people like who approach us kind of uh, you know ask us about uh, you know this even when they they are too obsessed about this 10 categories uh, okay what i mean let us start with the fundamentals is what are these categories all about actually yeah so with the eb1a um uscis has developed these categories that they expect people to achieve it's kind of like a point system where they want people to accomplish certain things within these categories uh, and together uh you fall under the category of the EB1A uh extraordinary individual so um they're kind of like a point system they don't explicitly say it's points but that's a, the way you could think about it that they're tallying points up based off of the three criteria that they you've selected and uh, because at the end of the day it's a totality they're combining your evidences and the entire case uh together and so uh that's a good way to think about it like you're trying to tally up points okay now that begs another question actually that out why only 3 out of 10 what are what is the uscs trying to look at or expect from, from people so yeah i'm sure there's going to be people that can probably get 10 out of 10 you know some of those completely in the stars type people um the restricting it to three criteria i think has two uh goals right one to focus your ability into certain categories they want to see you excel in certain things right and um by limiting it to three you're also letting people know that it's not something that's going to be extremely excessive in terms of the evidentiary standard okay now in true sense uh, does this actually make somebody uh, i mean why they call it extraordinary up there so uh, they do have a very high criteria so the the criteria is still very high so you have these 10 categories you still have to do very specific things under each one and it is a uh, higher level but um in regards to your question is that what makes someone extraordinary no no the evidence uh, the extraordinary individual is someone who could provide the evidence and the evidence has specific weight it shows something specific about you as an individual understood now the uscis also has another category called exceptional ability in i think eb2 yes the national EB2. interest waiver if you don't meet advanced degree then uh, they have exceptional ability now how is that exceptional ability different from extraordinary actually ability yeah uh, okay so ex- just based off of the terms themselves they're they're they kind of categorize them exceptional ability is you're exceptional but it doesn't mean you're extraordinary extraordinary means you're above the or i don't want to say above you <clears throat> you are um at a higher level than someone who is exceptional it's just based off of the terms themselves they're tr- creating a uh a separation right and they're also the eb1 eb2 they these categories are in chrono- like a specific order so it is easier to become a to establish that you're an extraordinary individual than it is to ex- uh it's harder to ex- show that you're extraordinary than exceptional and the there are categories you have to complete with the eb2 they are uh distinct from the in in some ways from the uh, extraordinary individual with the eb1 um there are similarities and the weight of the evidence is different uh okay now uh, coming back to the fundamental let's break down before we get into the specific uh, you know category by category let's talk about uh, you know eb1a eb1b and eb1c 
there right. seems to be while all of them are called uh, eb1 extraordinary ability yes now if you look at it yes of course for eb1a you don't need a sponsor you don't need a job you don't need any kind of uh, you know well i mean like eb5 a million dollar you yes. don't need firm and you can be anywhere in the world actually that you apply this mm-hmm. now eb eb1b and eb1c do require jobs and other thing i mean yes. as compared to let's say let me ask you a question as a lawyer actually so on the scale of 1 to 10 if we were to put eb1a as 10 how would you put eb1b eb1c and eb2 okay so the the eb1s i would put them at pretty much around the same level um the extraordinary individual is an extraordinary person with extraordinary ability is definitely a little better but outstanding professors and researchers do still need to uh, establish a very high level uh of evidence and so do the certain uh, multinational executives so i would put those you know approximately at the same level when it comes to the eb1s and then the national interest waiver in eb2 is uh, slightly below those um and you know what does make these so attractive is the 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 fact that there is no a priority uh excuse me there is no priority in regards to when the visas are issued so we have um a lot of people stuck in EB2s waiting for their visa to process and that also is one of the reasons that they make this a little more difficult okay, okay. um but if uh, yeah if, i would say the EB1s are definitely the most difficult to get and and the EB1a is you know I, they actually already show us the order of difficulty just EB1a EB 1b b c so they've already uh, kind of hinted at it when they established these laws and um they've hinted at what what they think is the most difficult and the order that it's in okay now i would since the today's topic is about breaking down about the 10 criteria so yeah. let me take something which comes uh, most of the people who are working in companies and they're having regular jobs and uh, So the let's take there I'm just picking up without any order of priority let's talk about evidence that you command a high salary or other significantly high remuneration in relation to the field so could you talk more about this category all right so when it comes to uh, specifically the high salary what you trying to show so um whenever we're looking at what is presented to USCIS in this in your application you're first showing them a piece of evidence and then you're trying to establish that this piece of evidence is is weighty it has uh an impact on your case okay and when it comes to the high salary in some of the other categories there really isn't a lot of evidence that you can provide right so if i'm saying i have a high salary i just have to prove i have a high salary and so this is one of the categories that um i'm not going to say it's easy to get but it's one of those categories that are not hard to misconstrue or or allows for bias or of the officer who's adjudicating your case um and subjective input so if you are in like the top 10 to i would maybe say in the above 10% in your field in terms of how much you're earning so uh then you've reached this high salary you know what i mean so it's it's very straightforward and um and the the USCIS is very plain when it comes to uh this category it's a high salary um and they break it down in terms of salary uh remunerations and uh, compensation so there are uh, different methods of establishing that you are uh that you command a high salary um so but it is again it's a more objective straightforward not a lot of subjective into input into it establish what your salary is or establish what your compensation is and you show it to USCIS this is different than maybe something like the artistic display where or scholarly articles um where they first have to do multiple steps and first seeing is it a scholarly article is it 
how, is it your own authorship? You know, things like that. So there's multi layers. This is, you have okay, a high salary. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, when you, let's just say, for example, you mentioned that 10%, you should be in the 10%. Now, 10% of what? 10%? Uh, the highest 10%. So your salary is first based off of the local area that you're in. So, uh, for example, if you're in California and you're working in tech, you're competing against a lot more people and a lot more uh, industry than if you're in, let's say, Arkansas, just for example. So the the local high salary in California is going to be a lot higher. It's going to be skewed a lot more to the right than it is in Arkansas. So it's a high salary relative to your um, the compensation of others uh, in comparison. So that's why I'm saying 10%. You're in the highest 10% of uh, people of earners in your field and in your uh, geographic area. Okay. Okay. So let's move to the next category, which is about evidence of your performance of a leading or a critical role in the distinguished organizations. Now, there are four words which are very unique leading, critical, distinguished, and organizations. Now, yes. who are the kind of people who would there? So, I understand that there has been also a notification to an impact that even divisions and departments are being considered uh, by latest. So, which organizations are we talking about? Somebody who is having a startup or his own company or something like that, will that work in this case? So, uh, when it comes to the organizations, so like you said, there's, there's a specific language that is used and each part of this statement requires a little bit of detailed looking, right? First, we got to look at what leading is and then what is a critical role and what are these organizations? And so uh, USCIS has has pretty much explained uh, what they consider um, a leading role. So first is leading or critical role. They use those interchangeably. It's either that or that. You don't have to be both leading and a critical person. Leading role is anything that establishes that within the divisions of the organization, you command uh, authority and you have a specific title that lends to your leading role, right? Um, a critical role is something more, a supporting role. So you, instead of someone who's critical to a uh, let's say a project doesn't necessarily have to be the leading individual, right? <clears throat> That's why there's a distinction. They use both of those terms. So a critical person is someone who's necessary to the outcome of the project or is necessary uh, for the completion or is necessary for the success of what is being worked on or, or the success of of the company or the role uh, success of the company. So those are differences between someone who's a leader and someone who has a critical role. Um, and the next thing we got to consider is, is the, the organizations, right? Um, so the organization, uh, you know, you mentioned something about, can it be a startup? Can it be, uh, does it have to be already established? So, um, and then there's also different divisions or departments within an organization. So, and the, the, the distinguished reputation. So the size, longevity of an organization is what usually lends itself to distinguish, the distinguished reputation of an organization. So these are some of the re, re, uh, um, subjective factors that you're going to have, you have to establish about your organization. Um, you have to, you know, if you believe personally that your organization that you work with has a distinguished reputation, you have to establish it. All right. And then you're going to have to provide more evidence if this organization is not as well known. Right. For me to say that Bank of America is a well known organization with a distinguished reputation is, is I, I can say it. I still have to provide evidence, just, you know, maybe some details about their income and a little bit of facts about it, but that's going to be a lot easier to establish that it's a distinguished uh, organization than it is to, for a entrepreneur who for recently, uh, or 
entrepreneur who recently established the corporation. So the, there's no longevity. Let's say it's been around for five years. The startup um, is it's gonna you're gonna need to provide more evidence to establish the fact, right? Um, so that's what it comes to in regards to the leading critical role in a distinguished organization. Okay. But just a quick question regarding that salary part. So you mentioned yes. somebody in locally in California, I know yes. about a tech company, you just gave an example about it. Now, so what about someone who is outside the USA actually? So is that converted into dollars or is it a, is it considered, how, how is the parameter assessed then in that case? Right, that's actually a very interesting question. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics and USCIS, well, USCIS uses specific sources of information to establish whether you are uh, a person of, if you're getting a high salary. So yes, the salary has to be in US dollars, right? But they're also um, requesting that you establish that it's a high salary based off of the geographic uh, or position appropriate. So if uh, there's two things you got to think about is the geographic and the position, and it has to be in US dollars uh, or converted into US dollars. Uh, you got to establish it that way. Um, and again, so if you don't have a geographic component, then you would have to uh, establish it more. So like I said, if you're trying to establish a fact, you need to provide evidence to that fact. And if you don't have one piece of uh, evidence to support the fact, you have to provide more evidence from a different place. So for example, let's say um, uh, the geographic location is in question, um, then you need to show that in regards to the position, the uh, compensation is a lot higher. So if you bring it down here, you got to bring it up here. So that, that's how I would deal with that situation. But again, it has to be in US dollars. And um, I would recommend it you know, you to be in the United States when it's uh, working on this, but it's not necessary. Okay. Okay. Now let's take uh, the next category, which is like uh, evidence of your original scientific, scholarly, artistic, athletic, or business related contribution actually here. So what can you elucidate on this? Okay. So, um, so there, again, a lot of these uh, categories are, um, very specific in terms of the terminology that they use, right? First, it has to be original contribution. It's uh, your original work and it's something that you have contributed to the field. It can't be, um, so it's kind of like when people write a thesis, right? When you're a, a doctorate or even in your master's, you're writing a thesis, you're, spe you're expected to produce an original work. That's that's how you got to think about in regards to this original part. And then major significance, that's see that there's certain words that, you know, you got to catch your attention when they're a little vague or they can be understood by multiple people in different ways. That's got to, you know, make attract your attention. So uh, contributions of major significance, major significance. So um, what is major significance? You know, um, and that's going to, again, it's going to be subjective based off of your field and the reputation that it gets or like how much publicity it gets. So um, what I first think of when I think of major significance, I think of CRISPR. So this, you know, uh, enzyme technology using uh, the editing of genes, right? The, this was like a huge breakthrough in, in science and in genetics and biology. So it was something that, come, you know, Nobel Peace Prize was given for it, uh, this uh, original contribution to the field of genetics. I'm not saying that it has to be to that level, um, but I'm saying that it has to have an impact on the field. It can't just, uh, you can't just write an article and, you know, no one uses it. So one of the things that we look at is, are these articles um, being cited by other people? So are you influencing uh, or impacting the field? So the way that you can um, 
you know, the way you can uh, weigh that is by citations. All right, that's another way you can like if uh, uh, in regards to an article. Um, and there's also like you can get expert opinions or opinions of other people that say that you have made a major, uh, you've made uh, an impact of major significance in the field. So this is these are things that again, uh, this major significance part is subjective, and so you have a fact that you're trying to establish, and then we are trying to prove it with evidence and each piece of evidence is then looked at on its own and so you have a piece of evidence that is stronger than the next piece of evidence and that's okay so yeah and we're looking the officer is going to be looking at them overall um and so that helps to establish the fact that it's of major significance okay now is, is i mean i will just take a pause here and ask you a different question altogether many people perceive that uh, and it is like eb one it is easier or it is for people who are only phd's or of course uh, is it uh, but do we no that's not true i don't i what i'm saying isn't that it's only restricted to phd's i'm just saying that phd's in their day to day work uh, are more likely to do these things but you know project manager software engineer uh even like an architect or an engineer if, if you can uh impact your field you can you can reach this category you don't have to be a phd it just so happens that because the phds are in academia they're pu they're pushing out uh, a lot of articles they're they're working and doing research on a day-to-day -day basis whereas someone who has a, a nine to five job can only do it on the weekends or in collaboration at work in regards to extra time to spend on it so it's just it just so happens that it have P phds or doctors uh, in this academic field are just more exposed to some of these things but it's not restricted to them okay that's good, actually. And then the next category we'll take up is the membership in associations in the field, which demand outstanding achievement of their members. Yeah. So this is actually one of my favorites um, because it's kind of like it's very. It's, this is even better than salary, right? I just have to show that I'm in a membership, like I've been uh, accepted into this society, right? And the criteria for people in the society or is this this and this right um and yeah they're just very straightforward and so the uscis gives guidelines as to what types of membership is required so um and what the organization looks at to make a decision whether they allow you to enter so there there has to be a a threshold you have to pass in terms of your experience, education, years of work, uh, et cetera, that you have to establish to be entered into this organization. So it's definitely something that I would highly recommend for someone that's trying to get this EB1A, that if, if you're in a field that does have um, uh, societies of honor and recognition to be a part of them. Okay, now is it only like, uh... You know, when you talk about salary, of course, it's very objective and very straightforward organization that we are working. Now, is it has to be now these things are plural in nature or it is singular in a sense that one membership is sufficient. One role that or project that you did with the company that had a good impact, yeah. that is sufficient. Or, uh, you know, you even in terms of contribution, you spoke about you wrote one article that had a good impact that is sufficient. But it has to be multiple, like consistent over the period and something like that. No, it needs to be multiple and consistent. Um, okay. Unless it has a huge impact. So like How I said, you when you're that? trying to establish something, you can use little pieces of evidence that accumulate into something big, or you can use one piece of big evidence. So uh, it's all way, it's all pieces of evidence on a scale that's being measured out. Okay. The next we will take up is evidence of published material about you in yes. professional or major trade publication or other major media. So this is this comes down to publicity, 
has someone talked about you? So have has a major magazine uh, talked about you? So and um, and it's spe it's specified that it's professional or major trade publication. Um, but they also you know they which is interesting. They first say professional and major trade, and then they say other media relating to your person's work. So that kind of expands it. And um, there has been uh, policy uh, notes that definitely expanded a lot more. It's not restricted to written material. It can be other forms, other uh, pieces of media, other mediums of expression. So, um, and what's they request in, in terms of the published material is that you just have to provide them evidence of title, date, author of the material. Um, and it just has to be well known. So, um, there's a, you know, as attorneys, there's lawyerly or uh, there's a, ma a monthly magazine that's for lawyers that, you know, you can get a subscription for, um, that is a professional, um, major media. Uh, if I'm, you know, if I was interviewed for you know, immigration on that, that's a great piece of evidence. So um, what's actually really important is if when you're trying to get an EB1A, you really have to be informed about uh, the the fringes of your field. Like, you, you know, sometimes we get sucked into our work and we get kind of, uh, you know, narrow looking. We got to really expand. That's what they want for someone who's extraordinary, that they're not just doing their work and doing their work well. They, they're, they're using their free time to uh, get to know people, um, e even, you know, journalists or uh, writers or, you know, they're, they're not, they're more expansive. You know, what they used to call them back in the day is a renaissance man, a renaissance woman, that you're not restricted to just one thing and that's the only thing you can do you're able to use your knowledge and experience to uh do multi-layered uh things and that's what makes an individual extraordinary so basically you know you may be expert in one particular field but at the mm -hmm. same time there has been various facets of your personality demonstrated in the different levels and a different thing so all cumulatively that matters is that what I yeah mean? so just being an expert isn't enough you know, just being an expert is enough. You gotta, you gotta do more than just being an expert in your particular field. And this is kind of like a little bit of an example that, you know, how, how am I going to get published in a magazine, right? You got to talk to people, you got to network, you got to uh, put yourself out there. So it's also about uh, your personality and, and uh, your willingness to do certain things. Wonderful. Now, uh, you know, we take a, again, a very interesting it is perceived and believed that, you know, again, that this is only for Nobel laureates, Olympians or Oscar awardees. But at the same time, it says that evidence of receipt of lesser nationally or internationally recognizes prizes or awards for excellence. Yes. Now, just the, the language is evidence of receipt of lesser nationally than is or internationally recognized prizes or awards for excellence. So, yes. I mean, no yeah, it's kind of jumbled in there. Yeah, they yeah. they have a lot of uh, nuance in just a single small sentence. So what is yeah. an award? What do you mean by an award in this case? I mean, if you look at a dictionary definition of award, you can interpret it the way you want. Yeah. So in law, as we understand that you there is a legislative intent and there is a something called as a administrative purpose. Actually, then we'll like to you know, see it at a face value and something from a legislative intent. So. When USCIS looks at its own regulations, and would it look at it uh, from a legislative intent perspective from an officer? Because judiciary would always look at it from a legislative intent, but from an administrative as an administrative agency, would it look at it as a uh, you know at a face value, or would it go into a legislative intent? And what is it in this case? Yeah. So uh, what I always try to tell people is that the officer that's looking at your case may or might not be an attorney, right? Um, not all the officers that are reviewing these cases have an in-depth knowledge of the law. So they read the standards, the criteria, and, so, and then they look at the evidence and they just have to be able to uh, argue or, or, or establish if it goes, if they 
agree or they don't agree. And then they have to argue as to why they don't agree, right? Um, and again, they use pretty much the policy manual. And if they uh, have any further doubts or questions, they go on to maybe AAO decisions, the Administrative Appeals Office. So um, when it comes to what the officer is doing, it's most likely going to just be a strict reading of what's going on and then getting a little bit of guidance from uh, other places. So they're going to read receipt of lesser nationally or internationally recognized prizes or awards for excellence in the field of endeavor. All right. And so they're going to sit there. The, they've done this a bunch of times, right? So this isn't the first case they see. They're, they they realize that this is something that you're trying to establish. And then they're going to first, you know, first most likely work backwards, right? Is this the field or endeavor? Is, is this a ward in the field that they're talking about? Because that's something that they're, that's easy to check off. So yeah, you did get a award or a, a nationally recognized or internationally recognized prize in your field, right? Um, so a prize and an award, uh, I think uh, prizes usually have monetary gain attached to it, whereas an award is just like a plaque. Okay. Um, and and it's in it, the the controlling adjective in this um, sentence is excellence. All right. So um, they're trying to see that is it in your endeavor? Like that's the easy one to check off. And then excellence. So are you being recognized for your you know great ability or excellence in the field, right? So um, whether it's an award or a prize, um, what they're looking for is, was it given to you because you're an excellent individual? Okay. Now here comes a question, uh, Mohammed. Is when we talk about, you know, prizes or award, you use the word uh, recognition, which is one of the. I mean, if you look at the dictionary meaning of. Uh, award also it is one of the recognitions actually it's a token for recognition now obviously it means that it is not a part of some competition so somebody may may just recognize you by virtue of offering you a letter yeah somebody yeah, yeah. so you can get an you can be awarded or recognized you know internally in your office you know by your by your boss so yeah and the the what an award or a prize is is uh a lot easier to establish than the excellence. Okay, but in this case, uh, would uh, if you are recognized by your office, would it fall under national or international then in that case? So whenever you see or, yeah, that doesn't mean it has to do the one before it. So lesser nationally or internationally recognized or awards for excellence so um each or think of it as like a separation okay. and you have to do one of those not all of them so um if you're aiming for lesser nationally receipt of lesser nationally that's the one that you're going to aim for right and this is uh, a prize or an award and then there's internationally recognized and then there's award Okay, now are you, so this is a more uh, from a perspective of an academic understanding of a legal sentence. Yes, so now, a legal sentence that... and conjoins or separates. You don't have to do everything when there's or. Wonderful, this is very interesting. So you are saying that before or I can put a comma. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. Okay. So and, and, in, and in any document, something similar to this. So if if there is no comma we assume it is a connection yes okay so it is a construction of the the document or regulation yes. situation that might yes. so that yes is a so it's very important like when you're reading a a piece of legislation an or is is dr dramatically different than an and it can change completely how uh, a law is viewed or or understood so you know it's very important that this is something that's recognized. So that's this is uh, very very helpful, uh, because this gives in a very deeper perspective. So 
let's say for example if i'm working for a let's say fortune 500 company mm-hmm. and obviously the ceo of the fortune 500 company would be a very famous person mm-hmm. a good influencer in the field yes so if i were to get a recognition for my work even from my ceo if i'm working in a company and he is also pretty well known can i say it's an award for excellence for me and i in for i get it in form of a letter i get it in form of yeah a so award. so i would i would say yes and but what i would like to see in the letter is the word award and excellence so let's say the ceo of the company is saying is recognizing you for something right in the certificate or in the email or in the letter um the words we are awarding you with this recognition for your excellence that's what i would be looking for because um when exact language is used it it's hard to argue against it because what's the ius cis officer going to say like oh you got this award because you did a good job or or um it was your birthday uh, okay. no you need to say that this i was awarded this because i was excellent in the field of that i'm working in okay now this is a very interesting point because we spoke about a couple of categories and i have been for every category i've been trying to bring in a reference if somebody is working in an organization mm. now still uh, you talk about uh, you know salary we spoke about distinguished organization we spoke about membership we spoke about uh, you know critical role and this lesser or international and we said even in certain circumstances how this particular category can be fulfilled by people who are you know kind of working in their establishments now here comes a question here that while this is something uh this particular award uh, sorry this particular whole visa green card category is can be done by self petition and why is it that then in that case if somebody is working for let's say a very famous company or an established company or a fortune 500 company does it imply in your assessment that there is a more degree of likelihood like for they would go for eb2 or l1 visa or eb1c or even h1b they, it it is a very straightforward process for them if companies were to you know kind of sponsor their employees for eb1a it would even become further straightforward for them so if you had your employer's assistance in establishing this criterion yes no, it, no, not this criteria the entire all company. of them yeah any of them yeah, yeah. of these criterion or would it honestly um i think with the assistant like if your hr department um so the hr department usually helps with h1b's they're helping with the eb2's they're they're involved in the application process they talk to the attorneys they some of them like i've met you know when i've worked with the uh, different companies some of these hr people you know pretty much know the entire process um if these hr people were willing to assist people in cuz one of the things that makes establishing this criterion difficult is time right it takes time to uh publicize your work it takes time to write an article it takes time to judge someone's work it t- they all these things take time so if there was someone there to facilitate uh, or assist in in hel- uh in helping the employees establish these things i definitely see like employ employers would definitely see a lot more success and a lot of things move a lot more quickly so i think so what we are i'm i'm hearing correct me if i'm wrong or much so let's say for example we i mean we have always been hearing we call a lot of people who are uh, you know kind of great achievers and we have been inviting other eb many achievers to come here and they always you know it scares of lot of people that their petition is running into 1000 pages 2000 pages the whole petition with all set of evidences now of course because we are breaking down into various documents we are trying to fulfill each category and everything now are we saying that if i'm working with let's say you know one of the fortune 500 companies and uh, let's say for example my company is ready to sponsor me or help me for meeting this requirement they file i140 not even as a self petition but even as a 
principal sponsor and I have become the beneficiary for EB1. I don't know. No, no, the, you can't do that. You can't do that where you're the beneficiary. You're still self-petitioning, right? Uh, well, it doesn't. You, well, companies can sponsor, no? If you want, because I can be and I can be a sponsor as a company, and mm -hmm. I can always choose myself. Uh, I mean, a company can choose me to be a beneficiary. Yes, but are are we talking about facilitating their uh, completion of these criteria, no, or just no, like in general? Like, they be, like the way EB2 is done or EB1C is done, mm -hmm. we do it like for EB1A. The company is saying that, okay, I will do this for, let's say, Ranjit. I mean, the company says that I will do, they will do it for me. And they, in the I-140 form, principal applicant or the sponsor, I mean, petitioner is the company. And they do EB1A for me and they justify in a petition letter, maybe 50 pages, 100 pages all the 10 criteria or three criteria or four criteria and they say that he's a person of extraordinary ability now then is isn't that fulfills the evidence by itself because the company is saying this for somebody no no okay. so uh, again when you're trying to establish something who it comes from and then the so the amount of weight a piece of evidence is given depends on a few factors who it's coming from and what it is i got it so, the so petition they're going to automatically say you're being biased okay so if i'm the petitioner and the company gives the evidence that the weight is more is that what i'm hearing i'm about? still providing the evidence but i'm getting it from the company absolutely so that the weight will be more in that case for that individual okay i, I hear this so the documentation would become a lot simpler if the company is ready to support an individual. Yeah, I think facilitation and support would be something that uh, would definitely help a lot of people. So well, that's wonderful. So we have spoken about, I think, all the category membership. I think, uh, I think published material about you we spoke about. Now judging, would you like to judging? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, judging again is is one of those objective like almost objective criteria so the person's participation either individually or on a panel as a judge of the work of others in the same or an allied field of specialization right so um did you judge someone else's work and they do reference okay. peer review they also reference uh, a dissertation committee but they also uh use judging of uh, a competition or uh, some type of award but they, they the only restriction is that it's in the field of specialization or an allied field so you can't judge if you're in it you can't judge artwork like you, you can't just go to your you know local uh community center and be like judge someone's art that's not considered judging um, you need to do it in your area of specialization. Okay, now here, when you say judge the work of others, either uh, individual, so here is nothing about international or something. Somebody, it, it, no, if it is an, as a natural course of my job, then what happens? Natural course of your job, yes. So, suppose if I'm a professor or if I'm a teacher, that's and, fine. Uh, oh, yeah. so you're judging like your students' work. Absolutely. So I would say that it's you have to judge people at the same level as you or higher. Okay. Okay. That is the objective of the whole uh, category here. That you're 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 it's about your peers because one of the things that they say, um, uh, I've been invited, is that you're judging of the same allied field or specialization. So if you're you're judging someone's work, they either have to be in your same field or a similar field, but they're also insinuating that they either have to be at your same level or higher. Um, and if, and not significantly lower. So if you're a PhD student and you're judging the work of undergraduate students, I wouldn't say that completely takes it away. I would say that these undergraduate students are still producing work and you do have to judge them and it is a competition. So um, I just wouldn't take it so far as maybe high school, like a high school science fair wouldn't be the same thing as like a 
competition for a scholarship or something in college. Perfect. And uh, I mean, what, where would patents come in here actually? Like, you know, evidence of your original scientific, scholarly, artistic. So where would patents fall into all this? So patents, I would usually uh, have them fall on their major significance in the field. Like you contributed to the person's original scientific, scholarly, artistic, athletic, or business related contributions of major significance in the field. That's where I would usually put patents. But you could also, so when it comes to artistic display, it's, it's one of those that are vague. So you can use a lot of pieces of evidence to try to establish it. Um, so uh, it, it, with patents, I, I, I wouldn't say a patent falls. Unless you like your patent, you're displaying your patent and uh, you go show it off. One of the things I like for artistic display is maybe uh, is is that is kind of unique in the way of establishing it is maybe if you read an article at a symposium or, or at a conference or um, you're doing like a book signing like just displaying your work. Okay, now this is very interesting because we have left two category categories: evidence of commercial success in the performing arts, and second is about display. Now, are they strictly for artists according to your assessment or is it? No, no, artistic display. Yes. No, so the artistic display of person's work in the field at artistic exhibitions or showcases, all right? Um, the venue of the work is artistic exhibition. So what is artistic? Um, artistic is a very specific word like let's artistic is defined as you know having or revealing natural creative skill right okay. are you using natural creative skill when are you're you're doing your work i would say that even writing can be an artistic natural creative skill but what they say is display so you have to display it so um when they say display, I would use it, I would understand it as a common term that you're showing it to people. Is Are you showing your work in an artistic way? So, I got it. so that's a very, so does, so that is another aspect that this entire philosophy of, or the whole jurisprudence of ib one allows you to be a creative to an extent that it can be interpreted to the way we want is that what i'm hearing from you yeah so like i said the law uh is the language right there's language but there's there's gaps between the words right so okay. th there's ways of establishing facts in different ways so it's uh the document uh, i would not say this is a dead document this is a living document and it's a living interpretation of uh, the criterion. So you are saying that even somebody is speaking in a conference, would it could fall under uh, even display? One can utilize it. Yeah, I, I would. In, I would. It, so one of the things that you have to do is uh, provide evidence, right? If you're at a conference. How are you going to prove it? How are you, how are you going to provide that evidence to USCIS, right? Are you just going to tell them, oh, I just spoke at this conference? You also got to think about how you're going to show it to them. You can't show them a video. You can't send videos in the mail, right? Um, so what you have to do is do pictures or, or screenshots, right? So you can say, yeah, I was at this conference. Here are pictures of me, of me at the conference. Here's my poster at the conference, right? So you... You, if you're trying to establish something, you have to provide pieces of evidence that support that fact. So if you're trying to say my speech at a conference is an artistic display, prove it. I got it. I got it. So I think this closes our, uh, I think commercial success is very clear. It is performing arts is a one single word, I guess. So that's what we have to be. So I don't think 
is there uh, do you suggest that this can be interpreted for a non science non artistic uh, professionals so what are you referring to uh, the Evidence kind of, of your commercial success in the performing arts so performing arts is specific to performing arts okay so that's very right important. performing arts is performance so um yeah it, it has to be a performance perfect so i think today we broke down all the categories and we had a very innovative approach we spoke about the you know kind of uh, how companies can help people to kind of do it then we understood the even the jurisprudence of law in terms of uh, you know how to read the sentence or and you know and what are the implications of it and uh, seminars patents how they can be utilized uh, are there any other questions from the audience i'll be more than happy to take it as we are coming near the time so any questions just be please be free to ask if i have missed out something what any category and i would also say one of the questions in the chat box is which criteria speaking at a conference come under so um so are we like we just talked about we you can try to construe it in a way that it's artistic display but um you can also use that as scholarly authorship authorship of scholarly work because usually when you're giving a speech at a conference you're writing your speech so um you can also use that as in that criteria as well some of these things can overlap see uh mohammed when we look at all other visa categories where right mm -hmm. from b1 b2 to eb1 let's say exactly it's yeah. a complete extreme of the whole spectrum of visas yes green card now up till you go to i think up to eb 1a and 1b if you see eb 1c also it is very it's very mechanical in a sense there are check boxes everywhere i think to some extent eb 1b also allows you to give little flexibility but it is yeah there is it is not that it is little crisp liquid crystal you can say i mean you know it's a little viscous still but here what i'm understanding from you today is this is completely fluid actually if we one the way we interpret it it allows us to give allows yeah give some of the criteria definitely are fluid yeah definitely and but why is it that only for eb1 it has been like this while in other when it comes to even eb5 or when you talk of eb4 3 2 or other things or even up to eb1c it's so kind of fixed about everything actually so rigid So I would also say the national interest waiver also provides some flexibility. Yes. Um yes. but the reason I think those two things provide flexibility is because you're trying to establish you are as an individual fall under a specific category. You are a type of person. Right? Okay. And USCIS is by providing some flexibility is saying these types of people can establish these things okay now this is something a uh, question which has come that can articles yeah. uh, robotic big data published in linkedin consider as scholarly article so, so again you got to you got to establish two things is scholarly article so maybe it's a start a scholarly article but is it uh in a professional or major trade publication right or other major media right so i would it has to fall under one of those three things so if you're writing an article that is scholarly right and scholarly means um it's original research experimentation philosophical discourse that's what they usually refer to in terms of scholarly art article and, and either and again this one has or it's not and professional or major publication or other major media other major media can be youtube linkedin you know so yeah. other major media can definitely encompass uh an article about ai robotics big data published on linkedin so there has been in fact a recent circular which allows the online publication also so and if there is a comments or reviews that if you are able to present even if somebody were to use online medium and uh, you know kind of demonstrate evidences of reviews from a professionals would that be good enough find reviews of individuals like what do you mean yeah so for example if i kind of uh, write some article that's what the question states actually if i yeah. write some articles and if there are reviews by people on that commentary on those articles 
which have been written that it is excellent i get you know let's say 10000 likes i am doing an event where there are 300 people participating mm-hmm. let's say even on a linkedin live as we are doing today now would that be considered as a standard to fulfill one of the any of the criteria as or for public purpose of publication or showcase so it could be public it could be a showcase and like i just said it could it's artistic display and it's also a authorship of a scholarly article so i would say that it could all fall under multiple one one activity or one fact can go mm-hmm. manifest into different categories also will that be yes possible? yes yes wonderful uh, that's great any other question guys you can put it on chat box or you can uh, ask question so i think uh, we are if there are no other questions we will kind of stop it and uh, so we will kind of end this session right now so thank you very much friends have a great day yes you. you have a wonderful day yeah that's great